Hello and welcome to episode three of McVeigh Meets. I'm Paul McVeigh. I'm a keynote speaker and former professional footballer and I just want to say thanks very much for joining us wherever you are around the world and whether, however you're tuning in, whether that's on Instagram Live, whether you're live streaming on Twitter, whether you're on my Facebook page or whether you're on my YouTube channel. Welcome to everyone who's joining us today. Um, if you tuned in yesterday, then you would have seen me interviewing Henry Winter, the Chief Football Writer for The Times, and what a fascinating conversation chat that was with Henry. You know, he's at the cutting edge of football, knows exactly what he's doing, and I really, really loved having that time with him yesterday. Um, I suppose if anyone's joining us for the first time, I will just say the reason why I'm doing these series of interviews it's just because I'm feeling a bit helpless through the current situation with COVID-19. And I wanted to do my bit, so trying to help raise some money for the NHS and the wonderful job that they're actually doing. So that leads me nicely into my guest for today, which is the founder of King of Shaves, and it is Mr. Will King. Will, how are you doing? Paul, I'm very well. Here to shave some lives today with you, and a real delight to be talking to <laughs> such a well-known footballer. Um, so fantastic! Thank you for everybody that's joining us as well. Brilliant. Well, I suppose if, if you're talking about football, then I should probably just throw it out first. Are, are you a football fan? Have you got a football team? So look, here's the thing. Many years ago, I had a call from a guy called Peter Kenyon. Uh, you might know who he is. Um, he was then the chairman of Chelsea Football Club. Um, and I took a call from this guy and I didn't really know who he was. And he said, was I interested in signing John Terry to be the face of King of Shaves back in 2005? And I said, well, I don't know. I'm actually just about to go sailing across the Atlantic. It was my 40th birthday, booked a sailing trip, didn't know who JT was, knew, knew of Chelsea, of course, and, and how successful they were but sort of thought nothing of it until I came back from my sailing trip and went to my brother's house. Um, he's a massive football fan, Doug. And um, I said, look, I took this random call um, from a guy called Peter Kenyon. And um, it was about a guy called John Terry. Is he any good? And Doug goes, like, what do you mean? Is he any good? He's like the Chelsea captain. Why are they calling you? He look, might be like, like the next England captain. And I said, well, look, um, that, that apparently he wants to be the face of King of Shaves. And, um, and he said, well, you better sign him, hadn't you? So, so th there's a funny little story here. But my son Cameron went to school um, um, near where in Beaconsfield. Um, and one of his mates was Henry Wise, Dennis Wise's son. They're only about six or seven years old then. And anyhow, um, I, Dennis came out and I said, look, Dennis, um, you know, I've been around your house a couple of times. Look, I took a weird call from a guy called Peter Kenyon at Chelsea. And he says, why is he calling you? And I said, well, he wants me to do a deal with John Terry. And I said, he said, well, I'll tell you what, I need to speak to somebody. So he picks up the phone to a guy called Aaron Lincoln, who was John's agent. And um, the next moment, I found myself in Stamford Bridge signing a two-year deal with JT um, back in 2006. And met him, interviewed him, had him at press conferences. And um, yeah, if he was a big sailing guy, for sure, I'd have known who he was. But he was a, he was a good enough chap, <laughs> and um, that's that's an honest, true story. How how that happened Amazing. back in two thousand five and two thousand six. Crazy. Amazing. Yeah? What a, what a, what a great way to start start the conversation because at that stage I would have been just playing against them because that was the year that Norwich was in the Premier League, and you know you know that's that right. Kind of, that's right. Being a being a professional footballer, you get asked like a lot of similar questions over the years, and one of them is always, you know, who's the best player you've ever played against? And I suppose there's a couple of ways of answering that because if it was saying the best I've ever seen, I would just say Thierry Henry, you know, because being a little short arse as I am, you know, four he was a Gillette man, so to... he, he was signed to yeah. Gillette. So. <laughs> <I> <laughs> he was one of the faces of Gillette. So. What a player. But what a player, you know, amazing. But in terms of an actual defender that I played against, it was John Terry. And it was because yes. from an intelligence point of view, he was just on another level. So whenever I was trying to outsmart these defenders I'm playing against, because physically I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to compete with them because they're all six feet three, six feet four. And I'm, you know, as I say, five feet six. So I'm not going to be able to outmuscle them. So I always try to outsmart my defenders. 
but John Terry was just up here, up here, and just kept going. And you know, yeah. every single thing I tried, he'd already outsmarted me. Well, for sure. I, I tell you what, though, we didn't get a lot of love from the Liverpool fans and the Arsenal fans and the Tottenham Hotspur fans for King of Shades, yeah. but um, John did go on to, um, you know, captain England, and um, and it was a great and very surreal time in in my life. Um, and, and in the brand's life. So, yeah, it um, takes me back well, so 14 odd years now. And, and we're going to talk about that whole journey because, you know, I really am fascinated of, of how you've ended up where you are in you know, 2020. You've been on a, on a long journey, as, as, as everyone knows, very, very well-known figure in the business world. But I suppose I'd like to start of just the current situation. You know, if I'm trying to raise a little bit of money for... NHS and the wonderful work yeah. they're doing. I suppose if you're running, you know, a you know a large, large business that's that's based all over the world. How's how is your experience of lockdown just for yourself and your family as well as for your business? Yeah, I mean, look, it's a really surreal and unknown time. I founded King of Shades back in '93 at the back end of a recession, 27, 28 years ago. Um, so we've seen the financial crash of 2008. We saw 9/11. We've seen beards come along, a lot of beards in the last 10, 12 years with those pesky hipsters <laughs> coming out of North America and all of that stubble stuff. But right now, um, you know, our sales are, are holding up. I'm guessing um, men are still shaving if they want to shave. I know in the NHS, and we've got a lot of fans in the NHS, we've donated a lot of product there. Um, we have a, a key worker code on our website to get money off for them. And if you're wearing a surgical mask, it's a bit tough if you've got a full beard. So a lot of people have been advised to shave there. But it's, um, you know, it, it's shaving when I started the business. It was 90% clean shave and, and perhaps 10% beards and stubble. But now it's very, um, you know, very same amount across spread across types of people. And we do women's products as well. So we're in a, an essential products business. So people are still buying us where they can shop See many stores have closed, but it's an extraordinarily tough time. I, I mentor and am part of a lot of startup forums, a lot of WhatsApp groups, a lot of young people have seen this come along and not just crash their business, but completely change, I think, how everything's going to be for the foreseeable future. But, you know, phoenixes rises, rise from ashes, Paul. Um, it's important that you take stock of your situation, especially if you're in business, You'll have been able to spend more time with your family, I hope, and perhaps reconnect with people that you wouldn't normally see. But it's going to be different out the other side, um, same but, but different. And it's really important that people, you know, storms pass. I'm a sailing guy. The blue skies will come. And um, that you're in a position to look to the future in the next, in, in the next few months. And I wish everybody who's watching this video super well. Um, in terms of what the future is going to be for them, um, keep calm, keep clean shaven, of course, and carry on. <laughs> and and, and it, is, it is, as you say, you know, just such a surreal time for a lot of people. And and you know, there's a whole spectrum of challenges that the people are facing. You know, even if you don't have worries about money potentially because you might be able to carry on working, yeah. but then those same people might be in isolation by themselves and you know don't have that human contact that we all need and crave. And then you'll have all the way through That's to people right. who have lost their jobs, can't work, feeding families, bills, all the way through to just general health across across the whole world, really. But as, I suppose that if I were to ask you, what's the greatest challenge that you kind of face in, in your business? Because if you're you still have to produce the products, but I'm guessing it's in a completely different format. Yeah, I mean, when when. Um, COVID-19 came in a big way um, three or four weeks ago. Obviously, what happened first of all, and you'll remember this at the supermarkets, the lack of toilet roll and, and the pasta being stripped from the shelves. And a lot of those um, big retailers, the Tesco's, Boots, Sainsbury's, you know, their supply chains and their warehouses crashed. So we struggled for quite a few weeks to even get booking slots and get product in. And, you know, for example, it was when stores aren't ordering, it sort of often assumes that they've either got enough stock, but they're entirely out of stock. So the team were, had to be on the case with the supply chain teams and then the buyers, just to make sure that at least, you know, we're a business, that our products were available to be bought. Um, we saw a big spike in terms of our online sales from kingofshaves.com. So that's now tracking 
we're at about 50% people who regularly use this and a new 50%, which has never really happened before because we were so available from Boots and Superdrug and places like that. And now, of course, that we've passed that hiatus of the peak demand, it's now just making sure that we have availability, whether it's in store, online on Amazon or King of Shades, um, and we're there to be bought. What well, one interesting thing that did happen that we our shaving gel, I'll just show people a copy of it. Um, this is a pack of shaving gel here. Um, we do an antibacterial one, which um, when Carex ran out, um, it was doubling up as a hand wash. So we were selling <laughs> lots and lots and lots of shaving gels as, as hand washes, and they've got a lot of aloe in there, and, and it, it works really well. Yeah. But things have calmed down now, but probably we're running our business at about 60 to 70% of what we were doing pre-coronavirus, and it won't tick back up to 100%, I'm guessing, for you know between three to six months at least, and, and maybe it won't be the same. Um, maybe people will have just grown beards and got more relaxed with being, um, you know, a bit beardy or a bit stubbly. I yeah. hope not. Um, but it, it's 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 very interesting how people are, are looking at. I think their personal hygiene and and they're lounging around at home in you know in, in sweatshirts and pants. And there's only so much of that. I think people are, will will take. They will want yeah. it smarten up a little bit yeah. coming out the other side. I, th I think I think you're right. Physically. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that, that I purpose so. that people need, you know, just to get up in the morning, what's the reason to get up in the morning? And, you know, just from a personal point of view, one of the things that I've been trying to do is just go back into doing some sort of exercise every day. You know, it just gives me a reason to get up every yeah. morning because, you know, with my, as a keynote speaker, a lot of my events have been cancelled, even though I'm doing things over Zoom and but of course. way less than what I would have done before. But so I'm just thinking, right, can I get up, do some exercise, give me a focus and a purpose every single day. But listen, well, I so just because I know yeah. there's going to be people joining us all the time across Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. So if you are just joining us, Really, really delighted you've tuned in. Uh, my name is Paul McVeigh. I'm here with Will King, the founder of King of Shaves. And really, we're here just trying to interview a whole range of successful people from the world of sport, media, business, entrepreneurship, acting, TV, movies, etc. And all I wanted to do was I wanted to try and play my part of, of raising a little bit of money, whatever we can, for the NHS and the wonderful work they're doing. So thanks for joining us. So, well, it sounds like you've kind of, you know, you're almost at the top of the, your game in terms of getting to the top of your profession no, I reckon, no. business world. A few years ago, I reckon. When I signed, when I was signing professional yeah. footballers and stuff there. Yeah. A little bit older <laughs> in the tooth, Harry. older in the tooth now. <laughs> but you know, you know the, easy, the easy thing to look at you, or someone like you, and it doesn't have to be you, anyone in your position running you know, a multinational brand and company, and people can look at you and just think, oh, it's okay for you because you're in this position. But... I suppose it hasn't always been like this. So when you kind of look back no. at the at the kind of start of all this, where did this come from? You know, what why did you do this? And almost like why you? What what makes you special and different from anyone else who maybe tried and failed? Look, look, yeah. Look, nothing special about me. Okay. I I was born in Lowestoft in Suffolk. Um, if people know that's near Great Yarmouth. It it's not the hottest place yeah. on the planet, had a lot of unemployment decimated fishing industry, um, but I was the eldest of um, three brothers. Mum and Dad, Tony and Shirley, were teachers. So I've always had great store and education um, in that, but I wasn't that good at it. Didn't get great A-levels, um, C and two E's. That didn't get me into Southampton, where I should have gone. I ended up um, at Portsmouth Polytechnic, now the University of Portsmouth. Um, my passion was sailing, loved sailing. Would ideally have been a professional sailor, Loads of my mates are sailing guys, for example, Ben Ainsley in the America's Cup right now. A lot of the yeah, Olympian yeah. guys, um, Shirley Robertson. But I wasn't good enough to do that. Did a degree, wasn't good enough at Mechenge to do it. Um, Mum and Dad said, get a job. And I rang up um, a phone number and I got a job selling display advertising space for a marketing magazine in central London in 1987. Um, and you had to put 200 calls in a day pick up the phone 200 times, you'd get to speak to 10 people, you'd close two deals over the phone um, with your Rolodex, and that's how old I am, you know, phones had wires and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> um, but I, I, 
but I put I, yeah, not like Instagram Live and 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 all yeah, this sort no. of multi multi. <laughs> blue, blue um, and I was good, and I and I and I and I was um, headhunted. I was approached to join a conference production company, and I had a really great career. And then we had a recession in the early nineties, and interest rates hit 13 percent, and there was two to three million people unemployed, and big companies stopped spending money on product launches. So I was made redundant and lost my job. And I was on a good salary. I bought a flat I couldn't afford to live in, had to hand the company car back, um, had a bike, had to move out of my flat. And then I decided to, A, you know, do two things. But firstly, be my own boss. So if it all went wrong, it would be on my watch, be my responsibility. And then secondly, do a product. And something that, that a lot of Britain, Britain used to be hugely well known for products, of course, um, coming out of the Second World War, before that, the industrial era. Um, but then we went into a bit of a not making great products space. Um, Austin Allegro's, for example, and, and many other consumer products when the Japanese and the Chinese and whipped us and the you know, cars or computers. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to make a product and I didn't like shaving. I created a, an oil, a natural oil that you shaved with, hand bottled 10,000 of those because I had no money. Um, for a contract manufacturer to bottle them, created this shaving oil. And then my first stockist was Harrods. I rang up Har Harrods 0207691234. That was a phone number <laughs> and managed to persuade Mr. Al Fayed <laughs> to list it. Um, and we did £300 in sales, but that then got the brand noticed and we got into boots and then we bought shave.com for £18. And then we were the only alternative to Gillette from really from 1994 mm -hmm. through to 2005 after which Nivea for Men had launched and L'Oreal and now you've got the Harry's and the Dollar Shave Clubs and all of this um, other brands but if you imagine it Paul between 1993 and 2004 it was just us versus Gillette which was astonishing and that's how we came to do the deal with JT because I'm um, David Beckham was signed to I'm um, Gillette Fascinating. That that so so many questions spring up whenever you're you're telling me this. So first of all, how can your first supplier or first stocker, sorry, be Harrods? Because surely that's once you get to the very right top when you've been running for ten years. And yeah. secondly, um, how could you even begin to take on Gillette? Well, look, look. So for the first question, um, surname King, King of Shaves. Um, managed to get that trademark. People, many people won't know Gillette. The, the the name of the guy who invented Gillette, his first name was King, King Camp Gillette. That that's his Christian name. So even getting that trademark that um, I had to appeal at uh, European patent law because it was it's deemed a laudatory mark. It infers it's the best. And I had to argue it was my surname, and I had to blame my parents for the surname. Had it been yeah. the McVeigh of Shades, <laughs> there would have been no problem. But King. <laughs> <laughs> Getting King of Shades took well, a few quid <laughs> and quite a few years. Um, and then um, my view was, well, it, if it's the King of Shades and it's the best, perhaps the best department store in the world should stock it. In my view then, that was Harrods. Selfridges wasn't quite as popular as it is now, Harvey Nichols and stuff. And so I, I, I was persistent in sending in samples to Harris, say, look, you know, it's only a few hundred pounds of an order. Love to get King of Shades on sale. And, and we got it on sale and, and then did a great PR campaign. Um, and I found out that Will Carling, um, many people, hopefully people listening or watching yeah, this will remember he captained the England rugby squad back in the mid nineties, got him signed and then was persistent in bashing down boot store, um, driving up and down to their office then in central Nottingham. They decided to give me a shot, and our sales went from three hundred pounds to then fifty-seven thousand to then two hundred and fifty thousand. So it was an astonishing time. Um, and then, with regard to Gillette, look, the internet didn't exist in ninety-three. Really, you didn't have a Google, you didn't have a, you didn't have any what you have now. So I had no idea how big Gillette was. I had a couple of fox terrier dogs that kept me company. Um, I had a product that worked for me. Um, and now, as I think you've, you've said in your, in your thing, we've done over 15, 16 billion lives. That's how many times people have used our products over the past 27 years. But I'd know, so ignorance was bliss. 
Ing ignorance was bliss. All right, Gillette, yeah, you know, it'll be big, but yeah. And and the interesting thing that our biggest competitor um, was lack of awareness. And that's kind of how we came to do the Will Carling deal. It gave us a, a credibility as sportsmen. That's kind of how we did the JT deal. Um, a guy called Nathan Pillai helped pull that together, who was a, our advisor, just saying, like, Will, like, God, you've got to do this deal. I mean, it's like Gillette Beckham versus Kenny Shave John Terry, and you, he'll be the next England skipper. I mean, it makes you look so massive. I mean, we were quite big, yeah, but yeah. not Gillette big. Yeah. So all of those things. So it's don't have it in your mind how good a team is you're playing against. It's how good you are as an individual and how committed you are with your product or your service or your brand or your skill. Um, believe in yourself. Fantastic. And I always have. I mean, it's often it's not been as easy as that. Yeah, there's been quite a lot of dark times over the years. Um, and even, you know, the last six weeks, it's not been the easiest of times when you think, ooh, this is, this is just a little unexpected. Um, so I hope we'll come out the other side. We don't quite have the deep pockets the competitors have. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I believe in what we're doing and why we're doing it. And, and I suppose being, you know, in, in the interest that I have is all around the psychology and mindset of why people are successful, why people are able to, you know, reach their dreams or their goals and and you say like there's a lot of a lot of downsides and that's some of the things more I'd probably be interested in to hear is like what are what were some of the biggest challenges because it's obviously not the straight trajectory towards success so so what would be you say some of the biggest challenges you've faced and and even just going back to when you said you know you kept knocking on the door at boots because most people would get boots do you want to have my product and they say no and then that's it people would just stop and not yeah. go back Look, I mean, look, get used to constant rejection, okay? Um, it, 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 I'm used to it. I'm used no, to it. No, 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 no. Nobody wants to know you till you're a success. But it's also like if you're running a marathon, obviously the marathon couldn't be run this weekend because of COVID. But um, if you keep running, you know, sooner or later everybody else will drop away. And, and if you have that persistence and that ability to resist negativity, as long as you believe in what your product is and why you're doing it, so what your mission, value, purpose is, you know, I knew that using my product had stopped me getting really bad razor burn and rash, okay, which really annoyed me in my teenage years, my early years, in my 20s. And it, 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 it didn't feel good. I didn't feel attractive. I, I shaved it in oil. It solved those spotty, rashy problems. I felt a bit better about myself. Now... Not everybody suffers from razor burn problems, yeah? Most people go, like my business partner at the time, he said, yeah, so what? I'm like, I don't have any problem shaving, so, you know, well, I, I shave about once going, every well, it three weeks, me. so I don't even need to. <laughs> right, right. So it, as long as it, work, it, it works for you. And then I think in terms of, you know, tough, you, you guests get used to constant rejection. So it took me probably half a dozen trips to Boots. And even then getting listed, it was a struggle. And then even then when we were listed, it was a struggle. And then gradually you get a momentum, which when you're a small business, that's the hardest thing, yeah? You've got to have that momentum. And you've also got to what I call delegate, which is delegate to great people. So because I was a great sailor, a very good sailing instructor in my teens, you had to have lots of sailing instructors running the courses. And I was very good at working with good people. If they weren't so good, not working with them. So the team at King of Shaves now, one of the guys been with us 25 years, two of the girls been with us 20 years, the average is probably 15 years overall. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I, I want to have a great team around me. I want to hire people better than me at doing what they're doing. And then if you're, you know, if you're confident in your team, and you'll know this, um, playing football, if you've got a great team and it's got a great attacker and it's got a great defender, great goalie, great manager, and then lots of A pluses around that it's likely that you're going to win more games than the opposition. Um, and I've never had any issue in hiring people smarter or better than me. And many of the people I, I've hired over the years have then gone on to be CEOs or head up their own companies and, and be really successful in their industries as they've developed, which is, you know, I found really rewarding. But, you know, just view a no as a delayed yes. That would be my advice. No, a no is a not now. It's a not ever. Yeah, and timing, yeah. 
in life as well, super important. I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's it's so fascinating because, you know, we're, we're how many, four, five, six weeks into this lockdown. Um, actually, at the end of March, I was supposed to be in Singapore delivering a, a keynote for Microsoft. And then the, the borders were closed, the planes were grounded, and it was a bit like, oh, what a what a disaster that is. You've gone from, you know, potentially speaking for one of the biggest companies in the world, and suddenly it's I not know. happening. And just because it didn't happen in March, and incredibly, just on Friday, I just got confirmation that I'm now going to do it at the start of May. So it's just, yeah. it's so important whenever you say, like, those setbacks and those Things that might not necessarily happen right now still means that there's plenty of times and plenty of opportunities yeah. that could come along. Yeah, I mean, in life, in life's an arc, and right now we're in a little hiatus. Yeah, everybody, this was completely, let's say, unexpected. This time last year, you could not have imagined this, even this time six months ago. So the th the important thing for everybody to remember is, is everybody's in the same state. It's not something that is just, you know, taking certain people out or others. It's affecting everybody in, in very, very different ways. And like you, in terms of your speaking, a friend of mine, Brad Burton, he runs for networking, a British yeah. networking yeah, yeah. business, um, which was, yeah. so Brad's a good friend of mine, known him a long year, many years. Um, so his business was entirely predicated around people meeting up in hotels and motivating each other. And then suddenly they can't. So he's had to do a very fast pivot to do it virtually. We're doing for networking, you know, virtually. And I think it's been super successful for him um, in as much now he's getting more engagement because it's not so time consumptive to travel. Do you really need to be there in face? It's always great to meet people in the flesh, yeah? But really, yeah. I mean, a lot of stuff you can get done in a very different way. And he's been able to make a great success out of a business that could easily have gone to the wall. Um, people would have had no value in it. You wouldn't have been able to go to it. You might have just shrugged your, your hands and uh, given up. But he's like you, not that type of person. And he'll come out of it stronger, as I know you will. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, and I think it's, you know, it's, it is that where the lessons from not just COVID in this lockdown scenario, I think are, are not just for the current situation. This, these are life lessons, you know, the, the ability to be yeah. able to take what you can from this situation to then use it going forward. And I suppose just touching on that, that lessons. And again, I'll just, I'll just reiterate for anyone who is joining us because I know people are constantly joining on, on Twitter and Facebook, Instagram live, and of course on the YouTube channel. So I'm Paul McVeigh and I'm here with Will King, the founder of King of Shaves. Now, well, I suppose if we're just talking about lessons, one of the probably the most interesting things I'd like to know from you are if you were to look back on your, you know, 30, is it 35 year career, 20, 25? Yeah, you know, well, 20, long, yeah, 27 long. years at King of Shaves, but uh, yeah, over, okay. over three decades. Yeah. You know, so you're, so you're talking about a lot of experience, a lot of learnings. And I suppose, is there any way you can concisely tell us what are some of the most important things you've learned across that, that time? Yeah, um, so being entrepreneur has become a thing in the last 10, 12 years, you know, pretty much since the economic crash, um, 2007, eight. And it, it looks like a really cool, sexy, fun, work for yourself lifestyle where you might end up being a Zucks or Zuckerberg or a Branson or whoever. Um, but it's, it's a huge amount of hard work. Okay. Before that, and let's say in the nineties, when I started out, entrepreneur wasn't really a thing. You would have Alan Sugar famous for obviously computers and then, um, chairman of Tottenham Hotspur. And then you'd have Branson famous for, you know, Virgin Atlantic and Virgin records. But it wasn't so much a, it, they, they were people who started businesses. Now it's much more of a, a lifestyle, okay? Yeah. Now, when you do business, business is serious, yeah? I mean, it involves people giving you their money in return for a product or service they will want and value. Now, the situation we're in now, we're seeing a huge shakeout of, of things perhaps that aren't, whether you can buy them or whether you can't buy them, that people might not view them as quite so essential as they were pre-coronavirus. Right now, it's health, yeah? People just want to stay healthy, 
They just want to have a happiness and a health and see the family. It's not so much about, let's say, the luxury and the Instagram. I see a big thing about Instagrammers now sort of not making any money, and that's really tough for them. But I think a lot of those times have changed. So going back over the past 30 years, I have a little acronym, okay, SPACE, and it stands for this. It's quite simple to remember. Um, S, a, a daily satisfaction of success. So like today, Paul, you reached out to me through a mutual friend. Um, um, you said, would you come and do this call? Um, it can maybe raise some money. We can maybe talk to some people. So this, for me today, will be my little particular satisfaction of success that we've connected. We've shared some stuff. It's good things, and it's positive, okay? It's bite-sized successes. Don't be going after the massive win all the time. You're never going to win. I mean, look at Liverpool, yeah? Um, maybe, maybe not winning the league after 30 years. Let's hope, I hope they do. But it's super tough because they've waited three decades to become top yeah. of the tree again. So you've got to have the little little wins every day because if you're always holding out for the big ones, you're going to starve yourself. And then in terms of your business and your personality and what you're trying to do, P in the space, passion and persistence. Okay, Be passionate about what you do. It's, it sounds quite trite, but it's easy. If you're passionate about something, you enjoy it. Yeah, And it's not so much working. It, it's definitely a lot easier to be passionate about running a, 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 a shaving products business than it is perhaps um, doing a job that I don't really want to do. And then persistent, right? Keep at it. So here I am chatting to you 27 years in. Many of my competitors are 10 years old, 5 years old, Gillette 103 year old. So we're hanging in there. Then have an attitude of action, all right? If you say you're going to do something, then just do it. So I know even setting up with this call with you, with the tech, how it's rolling off your screen, what it's like on Instagram Live, getting it all sorted out. We, we, we were live and on top of it. We weren't, oh, people dialing in, where are they? Gone. So deliver on promise. Yeah. C um, in the space is confidence, common sense, and also community. So the confidence, people like confident people. They don't like arrogant people. They like confident people. Confident people are kind of sexy and you'd like to be with them, but don't be arrogant. All right? But then balance the confidence with the common sense. All right? We all are looking, I hope right now, for a sensible route from the government out of lockdown so we can get back to normality or what that looks like in our lives. We don't want something that, oh, it's all good, all go back to the pubs and then all go back and see everybody and then suddenly we've got another wave where maybe it might threaten our lives and our livelihoods and our businesses and our health. But so you want that confidence, but you want the common sense. And then the infuse, which is enthusiasm, which is just be enthusiastic about what you do and, and why you're doing it. Um, and then in terms of um, the E, that's pretty simple. That's um, enthuse, exceed, enjoy. Okay, and enjoyment probably the most. You know, if you were on life, it's not always easy to enjoy life. Often it's extraordinarily tough. But there are little moments in life that you should take in and hopefully you can share with others that, if nothing else, try and have a little bit of a, an enjoyment factor, a little bit of a smile, a little bit of happiness, a little bit about, you know, being the best you can be and, 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 and going along taking a rough with the smooth. Um, so that acronym there, it stood me in good stead past 27 odd years. Not always been easy to do, but net net yeah. more ups, more wins than losses, which is a good thing, I hope. That's That really is fantastic, Will, because I, I think that is so insightful to listen to someone like yourself, who's obviously been there, seen it, done it, still doing it, and yet all of those, whether it's a lesson, whether it's a piece of advice, but really it's just a framework to live your life by. and. You know, the kind of work that I do, it feels like I come across a lot of people who don't always seem to have that framework of like, what is it they're doing? Why are they doing what they're doing? And, you know, just a simple, simple question. If I'm ever standing and delivering in front of an audience, one of the first questions I'll ask people is about, do you know your definition of success? And whenever I was, you know, a 16 year old kid getting off the boat from Belfast to join Tottenham Hotspur, all I wanted to do was just be a professional footballer. So I knew from an early age, my definition was Premier League international footballer. But of course, coming out the other side of professional football, you're now thinking, okay, I don't necessarily just want to be 100% about my work. And I now my definition of success is all about balance. 
you know, because I don't want to be working all the time. I want to have some family time, some friends, stuff, some holidays, some training, actually, all of that stuff. But it seems like a lot of people don't always have that understanding of why they're doing what they're doing. So brilliant to hear exactly what you're saying. And, and I suppose I sometimes get a little bit deep with this because the last thing I want to do, and you know, I look, I know I look kind of relatively young with a baby face and stuff, but it's probably because I still can't grow a beard. But, but I don't want to end up, you know, kind of much later on during my kind of life, I'll be looking back with those regrets of thinking, oh, I wish I had done that and I wish I had done that because obviously that stage is too late. So I think probably because of the way that I've lived my life in terms of being much more aware of, of the psychology and mindset and just how important that is, that actually, I suppose if I work on this, then that will give me a much better base and platform through life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean it's fantastic what you're doing and the, and the life experiences that you've had and what you've enjoyed playing top flight football for a couple of Premier League clubs over... I mean, you've a huge amount that you can share with people. I think the interesting thing for me is, you know, in my network of, of let's call it business owners, entrepreneurs, whether they're startup or, or slightly larger, um, there aren't that many, to be honest with you. It's a relatively rarefied um, group of people. There aren't hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, let's say, Bransons or Sugars or Kings or Zuckerbergs. Um, and so it's important for us, you know, when you're in that sort of position there, to always be relatable to and relate to, you know, the customers and the consumers and the people who are supporting your business. And for example, with, with Branson and Virgin and trying to get money from the government to bail him out whilst he's got the island in Necker, yes, he's put a lot in, but you've got to judge the mood with people and you've got to do the right thing at the right time and get people behind you to support you. And the only way in doing that is always staying in touch you know, with your feet on the ground and your head in in the stars, let's say. And I'm sure what you've done or you're, what you're doing now as a, as a professional speaker is to take all of those lessons on the pitch and the times when it wasn't going so well for you and then the times it did go super well for you. And and, and try and, you know, frame those, um, that frame that narrative to an audience so they can make it work in their lives. And I think if nothing else over the years, I've been able with mum and dad being teachers, reciprocity, education has always been very important. I'm involved in quite a lot of things, mainly about education and, and giving back. And if you can do that, hopefully you remain relevant as an individual throughout your career span. You don't suddenly, people go, who, who's he or she? Yeah, but they're not current anymore. Um, so I try to keep abreast of current trends, let's say, you know, I've got a TikTok account, but I do a bit of stalk on that and look at things and <laughs> wonder how the hell brands make that work. And, you know, this whole Instagram and, and Facebook and comms. And, and you know, it, it's right now communication has never been more important and also humanity in that communication. And, and that's why it's such a pleasure and been such a pleasure to chat to you today. No, Brendan, absolutely. And, and I suppose the last question I'd have for you, Will, is is what's next? You know, when you when you have built an empire of through your passion, through hard work, a lot of probably blood, sweat and tears, what's next for you? Because once you've sort of done something like that, is it put your feet up and, you know, kick back for a while because you deserve it? Or is it, are you looking on to the next project? Yeah, hopefully. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can. 100%. Okay. So... King of Shades. <laughs> okay, right. Change your letter. Kingofshades.co. No, oh there's a story behind this. I was written up on, as being me. the um, founder of King of Shades as opposed to um, King of Shades. And they're made okay. in the UK and they actually auto fold. They're the world's first auto folding face hugging glasses that you can actually wear them there. And they're comfy on your face. So. It's taken 10 years to sort these out with the patents and they're going to be made in the UK and the design and they're called Shugs, sunglasses that hug. Okay, so that's a little, it's not really a side hustle, it's pretty serious, but it's yeah, something yeah. that coronavirus has conspired me against launching. You see people not wearing sunglasses inside, really, at the moment, or yeah. holiday. <laughs> um, so doing that... Um, I, I advise quite a lot of companies and people. I, I work with my wife, Tiger, Tiger Savage. She's a famous creative director. 
um, in some of her projects in advertising and branding. Um, obviously, keeping you know the nation cleanly shaved. And I think, uh, you know, I'll be 55 in a few months. Um, just seeing what the next five, 10 years is going to look like. I've got a 20-year-old son, Cameron, who's aiming to be elite rugby. He's, um, you know, now not being able to do any rugby um, in his second year at Cardiff Met. So making sure he's getting the necessary support he needs. Um, he's carrying an injury at the moment that hopefully will get sorted out when the hospitals reopen. Um, and then I think keeping a smile on my face and being there for people if I can help or assist them and hopefully, you know, looking out for myself and mum and dad, you know, in their late 80s, socially isolated down in Lowestoft. A bit fed up with life, but we Zoom them a couple of times a week and keep them smiling, um, tell them it will pass. But I think tough for older people. So, you know, just trying to keep a balanced outlook on life, Paul, best that I can. Brilliant. Well, Lil, I've got to say it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today and and hopefully you know wherever people are are tuning in from and i'm sure they're tuning in across the world across all the different platforms there is it would be impossible not to be learning things and lessons and key takeaways from from everything we've talked about there so i really really do appreciate you joining us and just to, to sign off i just want to let everybody know that the reason why i'm doing these series of mcveigh meets interviews with all the kind of most successful people i know is because just trying to raise a little bit of money for the NHS and the amazing work they're doing. So if you would like to donate a pound, two pound, couple of pounds, whatever you can afford, just go on to any of my profiles on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and donate, give what you can. Or if you want to just go on my Just Giving page, then you just have to type in McVeigh Meets and you'll be able to donate on there. But Will, thank you very much for, for coming on today. Really, really do appreciate having you on today and for anyone who might be joining me tomorrow um, I'm absolutely delighted to say that I'm going to have Harry Redknapp he's going to be joining us at 12 o'clock so he is one funny guy he is one funny guy so yeah he's he's an amazing guy so I am delighted to have Harry as well but Will thank you very much for joining us and for everyone else who's tuned in hope you have a great day stay safe and take care thank you Paul